Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third National All Jersey Nutrition Webinar. We're so glad that you're spending the next oh, a little less than an hour with us here today as we learn a little bit more about uh, feeding the milking herd with Jersey cows. First, my name is Laura Daniels, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. I am a dairy producer from Wisconsin, where I have a herd of about 300 Jersey cows. I also have been lucky enough to have a career in nutrition, and so it's my pleasure to be able to bring this opportunity to all of you today. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Bill Weiss, as well as Dr. Maurice Estrich from Eastridge, sorry about that, from the Ohio State University Department of Animal Science. As I mentioned, we will be focusing on milking cow nutrition and what makes it different to balance diets for Jersey cows uh, when compared to any other breed. And today's broadcast will be about 16 minutes long, the video portion of it. Afterwards, we will do a question and answer session, and we'll try doing a live session, but we'd also really appreciate it if you would please send your questions in throughout the presentation as you have them. If you could become acquainted with the question function, which is located in your control panel, that is the best way for us to receive those questions, and be sure to get them answered in, in the question and answer session at after the video presentation. Just so you know, only the pre presenters will be able to see your questions as you type them in. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get the video started on Jersey Nutrition for the Milking Herd. Bill Weiss, partner, or professor at the Department of Animal Science, uh, specializing in dairy cattle nutrition. Ray Seastreet, in the Department of Animal Sciences at Ohio State University, uh, professor working in the area of dairy cattle nutrition. What we're going to do today is talk about lactating cow nutrition and really kind of compare Jerseys to Holstein. The reason we're doing this is most of the data generated is with Holstein. So you need to know is it applicable to a Jersey or not. Yeah, as you hear the discussion a lot of times over the years, is well, there's an obvious difference of size and color, but when you boil that down, is there really any productive or metabolic differences among these two species? And one of the first things, when you formulate diets, we need an estimate of intake, because that's how we, we say cows need so many pounds of protein, so many mega cows of energy. And a lot of times we have to estimate intakes. Almost all the equations out there are with Holstein. There's a few Jersey equations, but most of them are, are Holstein based. They use body weight, milk production, days in milk. And most of the data says those equations are accurate for these guys, with one exception, and that's fresh cows. There's accumulating data that says one in late, lac late gestation, Holsteins decrease intake a lot more than Jerseys do. And that would suggest that the intake in early lactation, very fresh cows, is probably higher in a Jersey than a Holstein relative uh, to the rest of, of the lactation curve. So if you have fresh groups, that those intake predictions might not be appropriate for Jerseys. They likely eat more on a body weight basis than a Holstein. So when we think about that in terms of <clears throat> intake as a percent of body weight, Jerseys do eat more, but then the question comes up, okay, if they're eating more per unit of body weight, what are they doing with that energy then? Um, is it being used for milk production, uh, more, more on uh, adipose tissue deposition? Uh, but it, so as we look at that, obviously one of the differences between the two breeds is milk composition. And jerseys are a lot higher in fat, a lot higher in protein. So the energy per unit of milk is a lot higher for jerseys. And so, but as we begin to express the uh, energy utilization per unit of energy in milk, there's not a lot of differences there uh, between the, the two breeds when, when we do that kind of comparison rather than just a, a crude comparison. But then as we begin to look at how jerseys may be using energy in some other ways like uh, adipose tissue <clears throat> uh, deposition or mobilization, 
there certainly is some research that would indicate that jerseys may not lose as much body weight right after calving, going back to the intake thing, Bill, that you were just discussing, uh, whereas Holsteins may lose a little weight a little bit more rapidly. Then they got a steeper climb to get back up to energy balance uh, in comparison to the jersey breed. So you, you pair that up with looking at the frame of a jersey cow and uh, with some data, some of these same studies that we're referring to, jerseys tend to deposit fat on the body a little differently than Holsteins. Uh, you know, one study we were looking at is where the fat depth over the rib and the thorough area was not as deep as a Holstein. But from just as you work with jersey cattle, you know that there's a quite a, a bit of fat deposit around the tailhead. So the message in that is when you're doing body condition scoring and thinking about energy utilization, uh, really pay attention to change over that prepartum, the postpartum, and, and realize that uh, the jerseys may uh, be depositing fat differently, and so you don't let that fool you when you actually are looking at change in body condition from uh, prepartum uh, to postpartum. The other thing to tie into that um, is eating behavior. As we look at these girls here, uh, yes, they are tending to sort a little bit, but some, some of the work would indicate that um, jerseys tend to spread their meals out over a 24-hour period of time better than Holsteins. Uh, this can be good uh, because it can uh, provide a more stable room and environment. That, along with more chewing per unit of dry matter, which has been well documented, may keep room and pH a little bit higher, and therefore they can handle a little higher starch diet. But tying into this too, if they chew a little bit more, uh, reduce particle size of the forage that they do eat, that may be explaining some of the increases in the fiber digestibility we've seen in some studies, uh, which is a good thing, which the more fiber, the digestible the fiber, the more energy they can get from that. So there seems to be some differences in eating behavior. And uh, with that, uh, in conjunction then with the chewing, reducing particle size, increasing fiber digestibility potentially, and then from that, um, their chewing per unit of dry matter is higher, and they may uh, be more uh, uh, less risk uh, for rumen acidosis uh, with higher starts, uh, a little bit lower fiber diets. And there, there's direct studies showing that we cause acidosis where we feed a high amount of starch in a short period of time, we get an inflammatory response. Jerseys give much lower inflammatory response than Holsteins, which again suggests that either within the rumen or outside the rumen, they can handle acidosis better. Still not good, but they can handle it better than a Holstein, which would suggest you could probably push starch a little harder to a jersey than to a Holstein. As we move on from energy and think about uh, protein uh, intake, sure, we, we increase the, the protein concentration of the diets in Jersey sometimes compared to the Holstein because of just uh, in, uh, protein concentration in the milk. So their protein requirement is fairly high per unit of milk. But when you look at uh, efficiency of, of protein nitrogen utilization, uh, among several studies, uh, the efficiency has been similar there for protein utilization. On a, on a gross basis, though, if, if you have a, a Holstein and a Jersey produce the same amount of milk protein, the Jersey will be more efficient just because its maintenance requirement is less. But that, it's just a dilution thing. Metabolically, there's no evidence saying it's any different. And that would be true whether it's protein or energy, you know, because the smaller animal, but when you look, uh, and we talk about metabolic body weight, is where we like to look at things and then the similarity comes in. And so in general on protein, there's some studies, not a lot on amino acid requirements. The data so far says a Holstein on a, on a milk protein basis, jerseys and Holsteins are similar. Um, on rumen ne protein needs, they, they have to be similar. So I'd say in general, the protein data from a Holstein is probably fairly applicable to a jersey. And the, the last thing is minerals and vitamins. And, and this, there is some definite differences and some definite similarities. The two minerals we know are different between the breeds are copper and calcium. There's a protein in the liver that in the jersey is expressed more, it accumulates copper. So if I feed the same amount of copper to these two breeds, 
liver coppers will go up in jerseys. That doesn't mean that it's going to be toxic, it just means they accumulate a little bit more. But as long as you're reasonable at, at copper supplementation, copper concentrations, at, at 15 parts per million, there's probably very little difference between the breeds. 25, 30, 40 parts per million jerseys will accumulate substantially more. What do you say about that relative to source of the copper? It's probably, again, the more available, because this is a liver thing, it's not a, a gut thing. So the more available sources, you'd see a bigger difference between both. So that's the, the organic coppers fed the same amounts, the jersey would accumulate more in the, the liver than, say, the salt. So, again, people are worried about toxicity, and you should be, but you have to worry about deficiencies, too, because it'll be deficient in a lot of diets. So just be be uh, moderate. Again, 15 parts per million is perfectly safe. It'll meet their requirements in most situations. Yeah, and I think something important to, to realize in that too, it's an accumulation over time. And if suddenly there's a misformulation in the diet and it's caught fairly quickly, no harm, you exactly. can just switch that out. It, it's going to take some time to accumulate in the liver. Calcium, we all know uh, in, in milk fever, jerseys are much more susceptible for lots of reasons. Part of it, we think, is with respect to vitamin D receptors. So, in the dry cow, we know there's differences. There are probably difference in lactation, but calcium is fed in excess. I don't think it's a big deal for a lactating cow on calcium. Make sure you meet the requirement, feed a little bit extra, but that should, should be okay for calcium. But in this transition from dry yeah. to lactating, what, what's your recommendations yeah, yeah, there in trying yeah. to keep this homeostasis yeah, of calcium? You, know, you almost need, for, for jerseys, you really should be thinking negative DCAD. You, you t heard about this in the transition uh, seminar, negative DCAD, feed minerals exactly right. For the dry cow, they are clearly different. But once they start lactating again, calcium is in excess, it's probably not a big deal. So then as we covered a little bit on, on energy, uh, dry matter intake, protein, uh, minerals and uh, there, um, you know, sometimes we get the question of, well, just what about gross efficiency, pounds of, of milk per unit of dry matter intake? And so that's, you always kind of redefine that, well, you can't just compare pounds of milk to dry matter intake, you really got to look at energy corrected milk. But when you look at energy corrected milk per pound of dry matter intake, you know, there's, there's some bit of similarity between the breeds because um, when you, you get that extra uh, fat and protein concentration in the jersey, that brings them uh, up there. And so that efficiency of 1.4, 1.6 range pretty much applies. Yeah, and uh, if, if you have a, a jersey and a Holstein produce the same amount of milk protein, same amount of milk fat, the jersey wins in efficiency just because maintenance is less. But in general, a Holstein will produce more milk fat, more, more protein. So it, it, it kind of cancels out. But again, there's really no evidence that suggests that on a metabolic basis these guys are any more efficient than a, than a Holstein. So if you're looking at making a feeding change and you're expecting <coughs> X amount of milk increase from this feeding change, as long as you account for the energy concentration in, in the milk, you should expect a similar bump with jerseys or Holstein from this feeding change. And again, on minerals, there's a lot of minerals. I mean, we talk about calcium and copper. With phosphorus and selenium, there's comparative studies that are the same. So that, there's no difference there. But on some minerals, we think there might be differences. One is zinc. Jerseys and Holsteins fed the same diet. The jersey will accumulate less zinc in our liver, which suggests Jerseys might need a little more concent a little higher concentration to maintain proper liver concentrations. But again, that data right now is speculative. And on the same hand, if the same amount of iron is fed to jerseys and Holsteins, jerseys accumulate more. This is probably very much related to the same thing with copper. Iron is usually not a big deal, but if you'd have high iron water, maybe high really high iron uh, silages, feed a lot of blood meal you might get some excess iron accumulation. So just be aware of that. Lastly, on vitamins, and again, very few comparative studies with the exception of D. Vitamin D receptors are lower in jerseys, suggesting we need more. How much more, we don't know. It won't be a lot more. 
10, 20 percent more should cover it. The other vitamins, A and E, again, no data suggesting they're any different than a Holstein, so the recommendations for Holstein on a body weight basis should fit uh, jerseys as well. Again, you covered transition previously, but one of the big differences, important differences, is jerseys, Holsteins tend to drop intake as they approach parturition. 20-30% intake drop the last several days. Jerseys on a body weight basis tend to maintain intake during this transition period, which has been related as, as animals that maintain intake in transition are less likely to get ketosis. So that would be a, 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 another benefit of, or another difference between these guys. You'd have to be less concerned, you should be less concerned with ketosis in a jersey than a Holstein. So the fresh cow diet, uh, might take that into account. I think over time there's been some changes in how we're feeding the Holstein in that close-up period to try to minimize that drop in intake and going with higher fiber diets including you know more forage or including some straw in there to try to keep that intake uh, up there rather than that precipitous drop. And so it's not saying that you can't use those approaches with the jersey in the close-up period, but uh, there may be less risk in that drop in intake, so um, it may not be as critical to focus on that and, and uh, keeping that intake high right at calving. Because that, that intake really seems to be a key indicator to mobilizing adipose tissue. And if we get excessive uh, mobilization of adipose tissue when the energy is not really needed before calving, and let the, the non-esterified fatty acids go up and we get the uh, uh, ec mo uh, energy imbalance in a time when the cow's not lactating yet. And, and that puts her at more risk for disease postpartum. Okay. Again, after peak, around peak lactation and on, Holsteins and Jersey are nutritionally very equal. But I think the, this fresh cow, we, we do need research with Jerseys because there's enough data saying they are different we just don't know how different they might be. And going back to the feeding behavior, we, we discussed, you know, yes, they can, they can sort just like uh, Holstein cows, but uh, although we don't have specific evidence to point to this study, or that study, uh, jerseys are thought to, to be a little more uh, you know, propensity to sort because, as we all know, they have uh, pretty well uh, exercise freedom of movement of that tongue and it's the tongue that's is, uh, which pulls that feed in so they got a solid surface there to push that tongue out and, and get that feed the ingredients if, if it's not the particle size isn't well the moisture the TMR you get some settling it's easy for them to just pull that in and keep pushing feedback at a feed bunk to get those fine particles to sort, sort out so they may be a little more prone to sorting but to their advantage, maybe as we discussed earlier, the way the, uh, the chewing and rate of passage and so forth, that's what uh, keeps them from more having more grooming issues. and Dr. Eastridge are muted themselves. Okay. okay I, so, I... so there we go. That we've, we've got okay. one of you. Maybe let's check the other line. Make sure we can hear both of you. Dr. Eastridge, are you there? I'm here. Very good. We've got both of you. So back uh, to that important question, Dr. Weiss. <laughs> uh, I'll just say I, I also think jerseys are very cute, but I have no idea why. <laughs> Why they're cuter than a Holstein. So 
<laughs> That's all right. They say it's something about the proportion of the size of the eyes to the face, uh, I think. They, they, they look a, a lot like okay. a pawn. <laughs> Let's get on to something uh, a little more harder hitting. How does that sound? So, what are some of the common mistakes that you both see um, being made when when nutritionists are preparing uh, balanced rations, what they believe to be a balanced ration for a Jersey herd. What are some of the common pitfalls? Uh, Dr. Weiss, why don't you lead us off, but I'll, I'll have Dr. Eastrich go ahead and answer this question as well. Well, and this isn't unique to Jerseys, but uh, an estimate of dry matter intake or dry matter intake dictates the entire diet. Um, and the if if you're not measuring intake, then we rely on equations. And again, these equations are derived almost exclusively from Holstein data. And if you're wrong, say you estimate intake being a, a couple pounds more than you think they're more than they're actually eating, you won't feed enough nutrients. Your concentrations will be be too low. So. Get good dry matter intake um, is, is critical for everything. I think it's more critical for a Jersey herd simply because the equations are derived more from Holstein. So that that would be my biggest uh, it, or biggest concern on on common mistakes in formulation. I, I yeah, really I, great. Go ahead. I would really, totally agree, and and that's one of the challenges that we find on a number of farms uh, is they're not measuring intake. But so we try to really encourage that to, to measure those waybacks, monitor the bunk, to look at the quality of those waybacks. When is the bunk empty? Uh, when it becomes uh, empty, it's time to feed, not just based on time of day. And then I, I think the next step from that is then when you consider that the diet is about 70 to 75 percent carbohydrates that we really especially so we're feeding a lot of forage these animals have to look at the uh, digestibility of the forage and, and particle size of that forage uh, or digestibility of the fiber and the particle size of the forage so that we can get uh, our energy that we need to the animals and keep the room and help and I, I, I just add that it, when you're uncertain about intake, it is always more economical to estimate low intakes. In other words, overfeed concentrations a bit of all nutrients. It's the, the economically the best mistake to make. It's worse to overestimate feed intake because then often you reduce milk production. By underestimating feed intake, you inflate diet costs a little bit. But that's always less expensive than the than the converse. So, be a little conservative on your dry matter intake estimates. Yeah, that's great. Really great advice, and definitely true no matter the breed. However, I I definitely have seen in my own nutrition work, it seems to be off more in Jersey herds for some reason. Uh, the dry matter intake uh, can get out of whack quicker. Okay, so the next question that we have is, what about hoof health in jerseys? Is there anything that we should be doing different or that might be more important when we're balancing lactating rations for a jersey herd when it comes to hoof health? And, uh, yeah, Dr. Weiss, I believe, would take this one okay. to start uh -oh. with. I'll start and then get Maurice's comments as well. The two two things we know are nutritional things that are most related to hoof health is one is acidosis, uh, subclinical acidosis. For We think that's largely an inflammatory response to ruminal acidosis. And and as we mentioned in the, in the seminar, acidosis induces less inflammation in a jersey than a Holstein for reasons we don't know. But that would suggest that higher starch diets are should have less negative effect on hoof health than with a Holstein. That hasn't been proven directly, but the data would suggest that. Um, the other nutrient that has a clear link to hoof health is, is a, a, a vitamin called biotin. Uh, there is, to my knowledge, no data showing uh, with with uh, jerseys with with that vitamin. 
Um, however, the mode of action again would suggest it will work equally well in both Holstein and Jersey. Um, so that if hoof health is a problem, you should should definitely consider supplementing that vitamin. Uh, minerals, again, to my knowledge, there's no not much data. Zinc's been been adequate. Zinc uh, can reduce hoof problems. There is the data saying jerseys might need some more zinc, so you might want to uh, feed a little more zinc to these uh, to jerseys for hoof health. Um, the 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 type of zinc that has positive effects is organic. There's been no no data showing inorganic zinc has an effect on hoof health. So you might consider organic zinc supplementation uh, to jerseys uh, to improve hoof health. And Maurice might want to comment as well. No, those are great points, Bill. I guess the only thing else I, I would add is, you know, jerseys get lame, Holsteins get lame. Uh, is there more lameness in Jersey than Holstein? I, I don't really think so. Some, some data I think is out there. It's been a while since I've reviewed it that that there may be a little less in, in jerseys. So we got the nutritional things that to keep in mind. The other variable that comes into play um, that may have an impact is the structure and integrity of the hoof itself and one breed versus mm -hmm. the other. And a, a black dark hoof may have the pigmentation and, and some other structural things there may uh, reduce the risk of, of the softness of that tissue and and so, you know, as you pick up some feed, and I haven't picked up a lot of feed, but Dr. Weiss and I have been involved in, in a study a few years ago. And, um, yeah, jerseys just seem to have a harder hoof at times, but so that's a, a bit variable, too. As you look among uh, housing, are they on pasture or are they not? But by and large, I think the, the dark hoof of the jersey is a hard, uh, dark pigmented uh, structure that uh, may withstand some more difficult conditions than, than some uh, of the Holstein cattle. Yeah, really great, great discussion. The next question is about body condition. And um, is there a difference, is there a, a difference that we should expect towards the end of lactation with jerseys putting on more or less weight than Holsteins? And also, if you want to just track that back, what about at peak production? Um, do you think that the, the body condition changes um, are, the, are the same for the two breeds, or are there any differences? So, uh, Dr. Eastridge, why don't you take this one first? Well, as we shared in the webinar, we certainly think that there is some differences in how, where, and how they deposit fat, uh, subcutaneous fat. And so the jerseys tend to have a little less fat thickness in the thorough and the short rib area than the Holstein, but they also then conversely uh, tend to deposit a little bit more between the, the tail and the pin. So later in lactation as their energy uh, demand is dropping, but intake is, is uh, still very high, they'll, they'll increase uh, the adipose tissue deposition, body condition score will go up. And, and I think when you're body scoring, then you really, and I've noticed this for a number of years, you, you really have to be careful not to uh, provide a, a too high of a score for a jersey by letting your eyes focus on the, the tail area. You really got to look at the loin uh, or the short ribs and the thorough area and balance that out with what you're seeing in, in the tail head. Because if you focus too much on the tail head, you'll, you'll give her too high of a body condition score. And then like Bill was saying earlier, is they do tend to lose less body condition at the time of parturition. So we, we believe that then they're at a better start point in terms of intake and metabolic regulation there at the time of calving to be able to reach that peak milk yield. And we are focusing more and more on the, today and <clears throat> genetics of cows and feeding technology we have whereby that loss in body condition around the time of calving is not to the magnitude we used to be thinking it, it just we just had to accept we we, we can uh, make some changes to minimize that time of risk bill you can end there 
I think uh, you, you covered it pretty well. I would want to emphasize the importance of proper body condition at, at dry off because um, that affects lots of things. If, if cows are too fat uh, at dry off, they're usually too fat at calving. Um, watch just watch energy accumulation in, in late lactation. And as Marie said, sometimes just monitoring body condition, if you're you're not trained yourself right, you, you might think these cows are fatter or thinner than they really are. But uh, the time to fix condition cha condition problems is late lactation, not not the dry period. I think when you're looking at a thin jersey, she's just too thin. You know, you look at a Holstein, they're too thin. It's where you're going to really begin to see these differences is when they got a moderate to a bit of an excessive amount of fat deposition that you really see the differences occur in how they deposit subcutaneous fat. Yeah, really good. Very, very interesting. Uh, sounds like we might need to do a webinar on body condition scoring for jerseys. Maybe that should be added to the series. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next question that came in. Uh, this one is a um, interesting sort of a, um, a, pre, a, a look back at at, uh, at a tool we used to have, VST. Um, so many Jersey producers knew uh, that, that Jersey cows did respond in, incredibly well to Pozzolac. And now, of course, that's a tool that uh, most everywhere is completely unavailable. So what can we be doing to replace that lost milk production? Kind of an open-ended question here. <laughs> I'm going to let you guys decide who can take that one first. Oh, you um, just New Jersey. Uh, okay. The you know you used to with 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 the BST you'd get somewhere between 15 20 percent increase in milk. A uh, few technologies today will get you that much milk. A sing, single technology will get that much milk. But we know things. The the big big driver of milk production is feed intake. Uh, that's been known for 100 years. And, and we, there is some technologies now that are available to, to improve feed intake by, by cows. One is, is some of these high corn silage hybrids, high digestible hybrids. Those have been shown to increase feed intake, increase milk production. Um, there's new alfalfa varieties out there, high digestible alfalfas. They should. There's actually very little data, Holstein or other Holstein or Jersey but they should increase uh, feed intake. So I, I'd concentrate, there's there's some, some vitamin additives in early lactation, been shown to, choline for example, has been shown to increase production a bit. Chromium can increase production a bit. So I, I think you need to look at everything. There, there's not any single thing that will give you the same response as BST, but there's a lot of little things that should increase intake and should increase milk production. If everything works as expected with doing everything, you might get something similar to BST. I think those nutritional right. points are right on target. The other that I would really focus on is cow comfort, whether, whether it be the, the design of the stall, the uh, temperature and the environment in which the cow is housed, how long are they having to stand in the holding pen, everything about cow comfort and trying to improve all of those aspects so that the cow can uh, express the genetics that clearly they have and, and use the, the nutrients that they're consuming. Yeah, really great. Yeah, a challenge to replace that milk production. Although, as I look out over the countryside, there are plenty of herds that have found a way to do it. Um, so, so that is indeed encouraging. So, my next question: um, this this actually goes together with uh, something that you were just alluding to, Dr. Weiss. Um, it's a question about feed additive. So, the question goes like this: In today's economy, uh, we need to scrutinize every feed additive. What are the one or two additives that you would leave in the ration no matter what? Well, for, first, I just want to say you should always scrutinize feed additives in, in good times and bad. 
um, because it's if they don't work, they're always a waste of money. The the additive that I would feed no matter what is biotin. Um, it its effects on hoof health it is is very consistent, positive effects. Uh, very often you get increased milk production. The cost per cow per day is quite low. So that one I, I put in every diet. Um, another one to consider, and, and this one is, is a little bit, and Murray, I'm going to let Murray's comment on this because he's done some research. Yeast is, is a good additive, I think. Just It helps just keep everything stable. The cost is low. The return with a high quality yeast thing is probably consistently positive. So biotin would be my number one additive, no matter basically no matter what. So I I, I would agree. There's there's lots of studies out there with yeast, and it is low cost. The uh, the biotin, uh, very sound data on that. And, you know some of these things that sometimes we look at it we. We hardly call additives anymore, and so it's um, it gets to the point when you look at the genetics of the, the cows today um, and their requirements for even some of these vitamins and keeping that room and healthy so that we got ample microbial protein being synthesized that some of these things just become staple regardless of where the uh, the economy is on this because it's a return on investment. Yeah, great, really great uh, answers to that question. Okay, so one one more question. So this is the last call for everyone listening. If you have a question that has not been answered, please type that into um, the, the area there on the control panel so that we can get your question answered. Otherwise, this, this will be the last one if we don't have another come in. Okay, this question has to do with Jersey-specific research. And I think that um, those of us who are Jersey producers, we understand that most of the data that is out there is, is uh, most of the research is conducted on Holstein cows. So this question is, if you could do Jersey specific research on anything, what would you do first? <laughs> if, if it was up to me, the, the big area that I think there's ample evidence that they're different than Holstein is, is fresh cow nutrition. And even in Holstein, there's not a lot of really good data on fresh cow nutrition because it takes so many cows. The, the variability is so high. And the, it, what, what you do the first three weeks of that cow is going to affect, you know, all through the 300 day lactation. So things like how much protein in that, where, when intake is low, production is, is steaming up. How much protein do they need? How, how much starch can they handle? Thing, the, the, just these fundamental questions on these cows the first three weeks is, is essential. Again, we have limited data with Holstein. We have virtually no data with, with Jersey. So that, to me, would get the biggest bang for the buck. Great. Dr. Eastridge, anything to add to that? No, I, th I think Bill's uh, right on target there in the transition period when, when you consider the disease risk there, the rumen environment is still adapting to the change and uh, feed population being presented to it and, and how can we best utilize that microbial population with uh, carbohydrates and, and then we'll, the protein side, the, the amount of degradable protein, the uh, amount of undegradable protein and, and the digestibility of that undegradable protein. I think those are the fundamentals right in that first 30 to 60 days that can help set that peak milk and, and affect milk composition. And, and for, you know, I, that relationship between peak milk yield and total lactation milk yield is, is just as relevant for Jersey's as it is Holstein's. And so keeping the cow healthy and, and pushing for that, that peak, I, I think, is where we, if we had some more evidence that we could even get greater performance out of these uh, 
these cows. Yeah, really good. Any any final thoughts as we wrap up today's webinar from either of you? I appreciate the opportunity and some great questions. Yeah, I'm saying I, I echo what Dr. Eastridge just said. Very good. Well, thank you both so much for being with us today and for taking time out of your busy schedules to contribute to this webinar series. Um, we're very hopeful that uh, not only will the people who joined us today find this to be a valuable resource, but everyone who will be able to use this resource since it will be um, available. Uh, through the, the Jersey Association where people can access it. Um, so once again, thank you to Dr. Bill Weiss as well as Maurice Eastridge for your time, uh, both from The Ohio State University. And thanks everyone for the great questions today. And now just a reminder that our next webinar is tentatively scheduled for October 11th. We'll be post World Dairy Expo on this one. Hope to see many of you there. It will once again be at 3 p.m. Eastern time and we'll have Dr. Bob James who will be discussing heifer nutrition. So be sure to watch your email and the American Jersey Cattle Association's website and Facebook page for more information on this next webinar and webinars that will come after that. And also a reminder that if you missed the transition cow webinar that we had, um, you can now watch the full video on US Jersey's YouTube channel. National All Jersey would be interested to hear any feedback that you have as a viewer or as uh, someone who watched it live or went and watched the recording. Any comments that you have on how we can improve this can be sent to naj at usjersey.com. And so once again, thank you to everyone for joining us today.